Contractor's journey to self-mastery requires discipline, integrity, and respect. Welcome to Hammer and Grind. Welcome to Hammer and Grind, the podcast built for contractors, real contractors, true stories, real solutions. My name is Brad Hebner, and I will guide you on your journey to mastery of your construction business. You can find Hammer and Grind on all the social media platforms. Just search for Hammer and Grind Podcast. Now, if you're looking for more help, you can check out our free Facebook group called the Contractor Profit Group. I do free trainings in there, and it's a great community to be a part of. Now, if you're serious about making more money, saving more time, and creating a business that supports your lifestyle, check out my paid coaching group called The Profit Club. I've put together a proven system for creating a winning business. Now, listen, I'm so confident that you will succeed in my program. I'm now offering a 10x ROI guarantee. That means if you don't make at least a 10x return on your investment within a 12-month period, I will refund you the full amount. You can find out more information about The Profit Club at hammeringgrind.com forward slash The Profit Club. All right. On this podcast, we're going to be talking with Amy Payne. I'm super excited to have her on. Uh, Amy is a certified professional organizer, launched Lasting Order in 2011 with a goal of helping people live their one and only lives with purpose and intention. Her organizing firm helps people clear the clutter at home and at work. Amy is most passionate about utilizing technology to help business professionals maximize their time and resources at work. Amy, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Brad. So for the listeners, they they wouldn't know this, but we, you and I have known each other for quite a while since you started your business in 2011. Yes. I think, tell me if I'm wrong here. I think I was one of your first clients. You were actually my very first paying client and I greatly appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I had been in business for a couple of years and I think we met at a BNI. Is that yes. we yeah. met at a BNI, and I was like, I definitely need some help because I was two years in my business trying to floundering with files and all kinds of organization, and and uh, I was like, I definitely need to talk to this lady. And so, you actually came and did a little bit of work like for me for a short period of time while you were getting started, right. and you helped organize all my files and systematize all that, which to this day, I still use that. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we've, we've known each other for a while. So I appreciate you being on here, Amy. Well, I'm glad that you had me and I'm glad you took a chance on me in the beginning. So. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So what is lasting order? Like what's, tell me a little bit about yourself and what you're, what exactly what you do. Yeah. So when you first met me, I was still pretty clueless, <laughs> new, not really sure what I was doing, but I knew I had a passion for organizing. I knew how getting organized had changed my life. I was a very, very busy mom, stay at home mom for a long time, trying to learn how to organize my world, try to maintain my sanity with three small children. And so I really struggled with that and had to learn how to get organized. So once I did, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Everybody needs to get organized. Then I found out you could actually have a business and get paid to help other people get organized. So that was pretty amazing. So when I started my business, it just started with me just going into people's houses, businesses, trying to help them with paperwork, closets, stuff like that. And now we've really grown into this large organizing firm. Right now I've got eight employees in two different towns and we organize people's houses from attic to basement, the yard barn in the backyard, as I say. And then I personally work with other small businesses on productivity because I've learned in my business that the only way to maintain and grow is to get organized. And most of the best ways to do that is through technology. So I have become a true technology geek and a productivity geek, and I just love helping other businesses succeed because you can be super passionate about whatever it is that you're doing in your business. But if you can't call leads back on time and you can't follow up with customers and put estimates out and things like that, your business is not going to grow and it's impossible to hire as well. 
Yeah, I mean, that's you hit it right on the head, like 100%. So you started out pretty much just doing physical spaces for people like in their right. homes, right? And then you, yes. as you, and then you, that, I'm, I'm a guessing you can tell me, but as you're talking with people, they're probably like, hey, could you come to my office and help me do some of this stuff too? Right. I, I mean, you were my first client. That was a business client. So I knew from the beginning I wanted to help businesses. But in the beginning, it was more like a physical paperwork, like what I was doing with you or physical office spaces. But as my business grew, as I needed to hire, I quickly realized that they're, especially in the type of business where you're going into people's homes, you're not all sitting together in an office. You have to utilize technology to communicate with your employees, your customers, manage your projects. So I soon realized that that was the true niche that I needed to be in. Yeah. And, and I mean, let's be honest, you know, businesses tend to have more money available to, to pay professionals to come in because it's a productivity, right? Like if, if they're, productivity is not very good. They're losing money. Right. It's not like your house where, oh, you know, this is disorganized and I don't, I don't like it. Or you know what I mean? So that makes sense right. that you kind of graduated or, or gravitated towards the professional side of it. I know that early on, I helped you with some of your residential clients, you know, going in and mm -hmm. like building shelves and hanging pictures and things like that. So here's a little hit uh, tip. If you're a handyman or you do that types of stuff, go find some professional organizers and team up with them because they will they will definitely uh, keep you busy. Right. So. Especially if you do any kind of closet systems. That's yeah. a huge area where we, I know my business, we are always looking for a handyman, a carpenter, somebody to come in, build shelving, something. Yeah, because I would imagine that like in a home, a lot of that is closet shelving organization or stuff like stuff organization right like right. And, and probably and you could tell me this like wouldn't i would assume that closets are probably like the most disorganized part of someone's home i would say so and it's funny that you mentioned that because when people come to us and say hey i want to get my closet organized i'm like well which closet <laughs> do you <laughs> a closet is basically just an empty container so right. what are you putting in it it needs to really be customized depending on what you're wanting to store in that space. I think that's one of the most frustrating things for people when they buy a new home is they have these wire shelves that are just generic and they're not practical for anything because there was no purpose in mind when the builder built that specific closet. Yeah, th this was actually, I wasn't even planning on talking about this, but this, if, you, if, if you're dealing with home builders or even remodelers and they're remodeling someone's home, these are things that they can keep like to consider too with their clients. And that is the organizational aspect. So you'll appreciate this, Amy. I don't have a like complete floor plan design because my wife and I are in, you know, not like immediately, but in the process of trying to acquire land and build a house. And one of the things that I'm going to have in my house is what I'm calling the central closet. Mm. And it's literally going to be a closet in somewhere in the middle of the house where everything will be stored. And it's not going to be a, you know, two foot little walk-in closet. I mean, it's going to be the size of a room. Like right. it's going to be big enough to put, I mean, everything, Christmas decorations, like Everything will be in that. It's not going to be in an attic. It's not going to be in a basement. Right. It's going to be right there where you can easily access everything. So what's your thoughts on that? Is that a good idea or is that just a recipe for storing more crap? I don't know. I think that there, I see some positives there. I also see that it could be a recipe for disaster. With certain <laughs> people. <laughs> I feel like you and your wife are probably a little more organized than the average Joe. And yeah. in that case, you could probably make that happen. The challenge that you have when you have a big open space is you're still going to really need to divide out the purposes of different sections of the closet. Otherwise, right. it's just going to become one giant catch all. Right. That's good things to, to keep in mind. So if you're listening, you're a home builder, or you're remodeling, those are things that you might want to consider whenever you're helping someone is like actually designing in some storage space. And it may be worth it if you're a home builder, like if you're a custom home builder to actually bring in a professional organizer early on to help lay that out. Preach it. Preach it. <laughs> I have said so many times, if builders would consult with professional organizers, the homeowners would be so much happier. 
because we understand how people use the space, what people's habits and routines are. It's not just physically storing stuff, but how are you going to maintain the space with your habits? And if your habits, you know, most humans are inherently lazy. And so if builders kept all of those nuances and the psychology in mind, then they would build much better spaces for people. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you're you're talking about habits and I think that's probably the same as like behavior, right? Like we're habits of creature or creatures of habits rather and, and our behavior of how we actually do things. Like one thing that always like frustrates me and builders I like the mudroom idea simply because if you're coming in from outside and your clothes are dirty and your laundry room's right there. Like you have a storage area and all that stuff makes sense. But then I see new homes where the laundry room is like on the other end of the house right. <laughs> from every away from everything else. And it's like, that doesn't logically make any sense because right. you're going to end up throwing your clothes on the floor and they're going to sit there for a week. And you know what I mean? So just stuff like that. Or the houses where you, you have this beautiful mudroom, but that, Either the garage is so small, like right now we bought a pickup truck. We cannot enter into our house from the garage because the truck is in the way. And that's the only place to park the truck. So we come in now through the front door, which kind of defeats the purpose of the mudroom too. And so you look at which door are people actually going to use and plan the space around that as well. Yeah, but garages are for keeping all your crap in. You don't actually park your cars in there, right? That's, that's no. the whole point. <laughs> no, Brad, no. <laughs> I'm sure you love driving down the road and the guy's garage door is open and it's literally packed full of floor to ceiling and, you know, full of boxes and there's, <laughs> you can't I, get in there. I have joked so many times that I'm going to come up with some flyer and hang it on people's garages. Can't park in your garage? Give us a call. But then I'm afraid that's going to offend a lot of people. So we have not gone that route. Uh, sometimes you got to be polarizing, Amy. That that gets the attention, right? I don't know, Brad. Maybe you can get away with that. But that's just the rest, in me. The rest of us try to be nice. Nah, being nice is too much hard work. <laughs> So let's get into some business organization for contractors. I am a tech nerd as well. And so I love talking about this stuff. I could talk about this all day long and and technology, you know, to me, and not just in an organizational sense, but for, you know, whether it's a a PM software you use, a timesheet app, whatever, like technology is what I call a force multiplier. Right. So in other words, you can do more things with less people if you supplement with tech. Right. And so a lot of, you know, I see a lot of contractors, not a lot, but they'll want to hire a marketing person or they'll want to hire an office manager or they want to hire, you know, someone just to answer the phones and they want to hire people to do these tasks. And really, like some of these positions can be completely eliminated if they simply use technology. Have you seen that to be the case in in your clients and your experience? I think that one of the biggest challenges people have is trying to navigate how much technology is too much, though, because there still needs to be an element of human connection. It can't, everything can't just be automated. I mean, this is something I'm wrestling with in my own business right now. How much can be automated when responding to a lead versus that actual human touch in order to get the job. You don't want to seem so impersonal that, you know, they're not even speaking to a human ever. And they're thinking, what am I, you know, essentially in their mind, it's equivalent to calling one of your favorite services and you get someone in India, you know, it's frustrating because you just want to talk to a human. And so I think there's definitely technology can help supplement. I'm not sure if I believe in technology 100% replacing jobs. I don't know. I guess I would have to have more specific details about that. Well, yeah, I mean, that's fair. That's that's completely fair. But I, I think that in the old days, when I say old days, I mean like 20, 30 years ago before technology was really widely available. I mean, you know, businesses would have multiple people you know, you would have someone that all they did was answer the phone and then you would have somebody else that did accounts payable and accounts receivable. And I right. think like with QuickBooks and things like that, you don't necessarily need an accounts payable, accounts receivable person, right? True. Now, now the person answering the phone 
they can spend two hours a week doing AP, you know, all that stuff. True. So I think that's what I mean. Like, you don't, and I don't mean like completely replace someone. Like if you have five employees, you can put one piece of equipment or technology in and then you can eliminate all five positions. Right. But you might be able to consolidate down to four people, you know, instead of that fifth person. Right, right. It's a matter of working smarter, not harder, right? Why not let technology do some things for you that used to take a significant amount of time? Even QuickBooks, for example, you're running reports that maybe somebody used to have to calculate that for you. Or a lot of CRM systems, customer relationship management software, or FSM, you can run reports on that and find out where you're making your money from so that you know where to invest your marketing dollars instead of sitting there trying to guess or calculate things out by hand. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have you have a lot more data available to uh, analyze, which I think can be overwhelming too. like the amount of reports that I can run in all my softwares. Right. I could like literally look at reports for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Right. Like, there's, there's so many options available. And I don't think like especially at a contractor level, you don't need to be getting that deep into the weeds on like, how can I save three minutes on my drive time each day? Like right. you, you don't need to get that micro with that type of stuff. Right. But if you're not realizing that you're spending 45 minutes a day driving from one job to the next and you're not calculating that, that time into your dollar amount, your, what you're charging, you're losing lots of money, lots right. and lots of money. Right. Or if you're guessing later about how many miles you drove instead of using a technology that tracks it for you, you're guessing on what you could be getting in tax money back or tax deductions. So I, I remember the old the little the mileage logbooks, you know, you had to yes. pull them out and track your mile. I, I, I freaking hated that stuff. I absolutely hated tracking mileage. Now they have things you can like put in there and it does it all for you. That's a great example of technology like saving you time, right. right? And frustration. Yes. So I like to use the analogy of, and this isn't so much about uh, technology, but really creating systems in your business. But I, I believe that we all have like micro frustrations throughout the day, right? We get right. up and there's something about our house that we don't like. We don't like where the coffee maker is. And even though it's not that big of a deal, like it's every time we use the coffee maker, we get a little bit frustrated you know, just a tiny bit. And then as the day goes on, you have all these micro frustrations and it just overall creates this, you know, frustrated lifestyle where nothing's like how you want it. Right. And so I see technology and I see organization as being able to eliminate, you know, as, if we can eliminate as many frustrations as possible, I think that leads to a much happier life. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, one of the things that I that I teach over and over and over is organizing is about living a proactive life, not a reactive life. So what you're describing in these little micro frustrations is living reactively. You're not stopping and consciously thinking about where did I place the coffee maker, right? Is it in the right place? You're just allowing it to frustrate you every day. And so what I try to encourage people to do is stop and think about why are you doing things the way you're doing or what are you doing that you shouldn't be? What are you, what should you be doing that you shouldn't be? And then how can we fix that? You know, whether that's a space in your home, whether that's in your technology and your business, how can we help you go from reactive to proactive where you feel like you're in control of your destiny You've made conscious decisions about how you're choosing to spend your time, what you're trying to get accomplished in your business, and then you're able to be successful moving forward. I, I agree with that 100%. Are you familiar with Paul Akers and Fast Cap? And uh, he has a book called Two Second Lean. I, ha I am not. Okay. Well, he, he, he used to be a cabinet maker and he like started creating products to make cabinet making easier. And he, Ooh. now he owns a large manufacturing fast cap and they make all kinds of tools and products for uh, woodworkers and construction. But he got super, I'm sure you've heard of like Sigma six and lean manufacturing. Yes. So he got like super deep into that, went down the rabbit hole, like went to Japan and learned all this stuff. And what he did is condensed all of that, 
philosophy down into what he calls two second lean. Okay. And I love this and I think you would appreciate it too. But what he simply does is he takes processes that frustrate you and he calls it fix what bugs you. Like if there's something right. that bugs you, fix it. And then right. he says, basically try to make two second improvements. Don't go in there and try to like fix the entire process, right? right. If your estimating system doesn't work, right? Don't go in there and like try to get a whole new estimating system. You may just need to make a few little tweaks to that system. And then gradually, after you make a series of 15, 20 tweaks to the system, now you have a whole system that actually works really well for you. And so that's the premise of his book. I mean, he applies it more to like manufacturing, but also, I mean, he's he's ate up with this. Like if if you go to YouTube and watch his videos, like he literally two second leans everything in his life, his house, the guy probably lives the most like frustrating free life of anyone you've ever met. Wow. And, and, and if you go to his, he has a manufacturing facility, like where they make stuff, like you could eat off the floor in this manufacturing facility. It's super clean. Everything's organized. You could take someone that doesn't know anything and within like a day, they know how to use everything in the entire factory. Wow, that's amazing. I'll have to I look mean, into I, that. I, I think you would really appreciate it. Like you would probably binge on his videos for hours <laughs> because it's really amazing. Like, and he systematized everything. Right. And I mean everything. So what the system, systemization does though, is it forces you to have to have self-discipline. And that's where a lot of people struggle is yeah. how can I maintain? And I know that I'm truly after 11 years in this business and seeing such a wide variety of personalities, of people, of habits, of lifestyles, I truly believe that there are people who are more naturally inclined towards organization and self-discipline. Those of us, I would put myself in this category, that are not as naturally inclined in that direction. And so in order for someone who's less inclined in that direction, it takes a lot more work to get from point A to point B. It's not impossible. If I can learn how to be organized, anybody can. But it does take a lot more work, a lot more intentionality. Sometimes the accountability of having another person kind of walk through that with you. So that all sounds great. Like, hey, let's two second lean our whole life. But I don't know very many actual human beings that would go to that extreme with it, I guess. I'm always trying to find the balance of how organized is good enough, right? Done is better than perfect. People with perfectionism tend to procrastinate. They tend to not get things done because they want everything to be perfect. So I'm constantly trying to find that balance with people of in your life, at what point is it organized enough for you? And that's a great question. And I don't, I don't think that's it, like a, there's a, there's an ant, like a, a single answer to that. Like no. you can be done and then next week realize, oh, I want to organize this other thing. Exactly. So, and I think what you're speaking to is really more of the behavior aspect of it, right? Because okay. we talked about earlier creatures of habit. Um, so, well, one thing I, that, like what Paul was talking about is he, he the reason why he does two seconds is because anybody can take anybody can spend a few minutes to try to make a two second improvement right. and then it builds upon that right. right like you're not and so what's fascinating about his plan and then I'll get off of his, talking about him but they the first hour so they work an eight hour day the first hour of their day all they do is three s they sweep sort and standardize hmm. so they clean up their space. They organize everything and then they create a system. Like, because if you're working in like a space and you're doing like a specific task, you just improve one little task. And so they do that for the first hour. And then the next seven hours, they're like twice as productive mm. as companies that are working eight hour days. So even though they're losing an hour of production time, they're actually, you know, twice as productive. That's interesting. So it's, I mean, it's, it is really, really interesting. I think you would, like, like I said, I think you would probably binge on that for hours. <laughs> I may or may not. <laughs> I mean, it does it does kind of talk a lot more about manufacturing, but still, yeah. there's lots of things that that cross apply to every 
every aspect. Absolutely. I think that there's a lot of things in the, the lean and Six Sigma that definitely apply to even our closets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I talking about coffee maker, we used to have our coffee maker in a spot. And because it was on a small countertop area, we had one of those K is a Keurig. So we had one of those little K cup organizers, you mm -hmm. know, the springs in there. Well, you had to like, the only way it would fit was to lay it like vertically on its side. Oh. And it was just really, it was annoying to try and get it out. <laughs> right. And so I literally built, I mean, uh, being a carpenter, I built a little shelf that this would sit in and I, I screwed it to the bottom of the cabinet, Ooh. which is right above the coffee maker. And so now all you do is reach over and grab it and put it in there. And it like, that seems so like silly and like why, and I probably spent three hours, you know, between painting it and building it and right. figuring it all out. I probably spent three hours of my life creating this solution. However, after I had that solution in place, I never had any more frustrations in the morning dealing right. with coffee. So right. for me, it was worth it. And that's the key is for you, for each person, each person has to figure out what it is that they need, what's going to work best for them. And I think that's where working with someone like you or me can help them really hone in on what do I need. So that brings me to a good point. When you're dealing with employees and you're trying, like I'm a, I say I own a boss. Uh, I own a boss. <laughs> I own a business. You are. And I, and I have, uh, let's say I have five employees, right? And I'm like, okay, I, I listened to Brad and Amy. Now I'm motivated to organize my space. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to organize my work vehicles or work vans or whatever. Right. How much of that do you need to take into consideration your employees? Because if I go in there and create a whole system the way that I would use it, and then it's not the way my employees would use it, like how do you deal with that type of situation? Well, I think as the owner, I would hope that you really understand how they use that space. Um, most owners, and I could be wrong on this, I would think most owners have been the technician at some point. And so therefore, hopefully understand or recall what it was like to be the technician. So you really have to look through the eyes of the person that's doing the job. And then maybe the owner isn't the right person to create that particular system. I don't know. But if they do, and that's the way that the owner wants it done, then it's their responsibility to make sure everyone is trained to follow the system. So I think a, take into consideration the people that are going to use it before you just set up a random system. And then B, make sure that they're trained on how to do it. Would you, would you say it would be smart to bring them in like during the initial phase and be like, hey guys, we're going to reorganize the van. Is there any, like what's your top three things that you want to see? And then kind of incorporate that as best as you can. Because if you have five different people, you're going right. to get five different responses, Right. right. I would say that that's a good approach. I'm a very collaborative boss. I always am asking the opinion of my employees and I explain, they know that in the end, the decision is mine, but I do want to hear things from their perspective. I do want to know how they want things to function or, or what ideas they have. And then from there, whatever is decided, of course, is upon me as the owner. Gotcha. And then you just crack the whip and be like, I said that we're doing it this way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm a real whip cracker over here. <laughs> I mean, obviously you wouldn't like if, if, a, if an employee is like, oh, it would be nice if every van had this $5,000 piece of equipment. And you're oh, like, yeah, right. that's not, that's not yeah. feasible. Right. That's why so, the owner is the one making the actual decisions. Right. <laughs> right, 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 right. So let's let's get into technology a little bit about organizing your office, like in terms of, you know, running a construction business. What would you say is are some key types of software or technology that they would that they need to uh, implement or that you've seen to work with some of your clients? Right. Well, obviously, some sort of accounting software is absolutely key to any business, but especially a business that's got, you know, estimating and job materials and, and time and things like that. You definitely need something. I'm a huge fan of QuickBooks. I believe you mentioned that as well. That would be probably my number one. If nothing else, if you can't afford anything else, get, get QuickBooks to keep your finances organized. 
Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And they, and they do have a pretty good estimating and invoicing part of it. I didn't use that for my business because a lot, of, one of the things that I'll say with QuickBooks is they don't have any type of like scheduling or anything like that, which makes it very difficult to like try to use it. You know what I mean? So, well, there is QB time, which is tracking time, scheduling, timesheets. Well, I mean, like, like, like project management, like running the job, right. like yes. the plumber's going to be here on this day and I got to order materials on this right. day, like that, like kind of like a Gantt chart type of uh, scheduling. Right. I mean, I, I, I use QuickBooks for a long time. I mean, I still, I still do, uh, right. but I end up, what ends up happening is that once you move to like a project management type software, they usually have estimating, invoicing and all of the other things built into it. Right, right. So yeah, obviously then probably my favorite software is going to be some sort of a customer relationship management, um, FSM, a field service management, something like that. You can name it a lot of different things, but a software like that where you're managing your customer interactions, your client or your leads, as well as tasks and projects. Now, each one of those so kinds of software offers slightly different features. Um, that's actually one of my specialty areas is helping people select the right software for their business. A lot of times in, an, in a specific industry, um, you find someone like yourself, like Brad, for example, who has a software that they really love that they use and they recommend to everybody. And that's a fantastic way to go about it because the business owners themselves don't want to take all that time to do all that back end research. And if they know you and they trust you, they're more than likely going to go with what you're recommending. If you think that's a good fit for their business. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just brought up a bunch of PTSD around software selection <laughs> because I've spent, I don't know how many hundreds of hours trying to find the quote, perfect project management software, which still doesn't exist to this no. day. No. <laughs> if I was a millionaire, I would create my own project management software. Like that literally is something I would want to yeah. do. However, well, I hate to I break it to you, but your software wouldn't be perfect either. <laughs> oh, it would be perfect. Amy, come on. No, now. it wouldn't be perfect. I'm it would be perfect. You. I'm telling you it would be because I created it. Come on, it, Amy. It might be perfect for you. <laughs> it would not be perfect for everyone. And herein lies the exact problem. I know. <laughs> it's funny because we were emailing back and forth about some stuff before the podcast. And you're like, are we going to argue on the podcast? And I said, yes, that's what people yes. love to hear. And we, <laughs> we were able to incorporate it. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy now. Yeah, me too. I love good <laughs> argument. <laughs> uh, no, I, I have tried many different ones and there's a lot of them that are out there. The one that I typically recommend, and, and by no means do you, anyone have to use it, but I use a one called Projol. And uh, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. I did work out a deal with them because I'm a tech nerd and I came from an IT background. So I really like look at it. I, I'm on a first name basis with the head developer for that company. And so anytime like new features come out, he'll usually email me and say, hey, can you try these out and tell me what you think? Right. So I love that part of it because I can give direct feedback. Right. You know, some of these like larger that have been more established like they don't really care about your opinion. It's right. like, oh, I really don't like this. Can we have this feature? And then it just falls on deaf ears and they don't really care. I have but definitely company, found that, yes. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and to their point, like you can't make everyone happy, right? I right. can't add one little button right here just because you don't want to go move your mouse across the page and click the button over there. Like, right. like let's be real. We can't make everyone happy. Right. But um, so, okay, so software... Uh, what else? What what are the like QuickBooks accounting and then some type of PM software or, or something like that? What else would they need to look well, into? Well, if your PM software doesn't have task management, I think task management is absolutely key. People think, oh, I'll remember it in my head. Well, that's the whole problem with trying to scale your business is you get to the point you can't remember everything in your head. And if you told Sally Sue that you would get back to her on Tuesday with an estimate, and you don't have a task written down to get back with her, you may or may not get back with her. And then you look bad to her as a cust potential customer. Mm -hmm. And you may lose her as a customer. 
I think what, the no, the number one thing I hear complain about contractors in in particular is that they don't show up when they say they're going to, and they don't follow through on what they say they're going to do. Yeah, now, communication that, is huge. Right. That's not to say the work itself isn't going to be really good because I hear great things about the work that they're doing. But if you can't communicate with your leads and your potential clients and follow through on what you said, show up when you're supposed to, then you're not going to have a successful business for very long. Th- that was one of my greatest fears was being having too many leads. And I actually, I've had that problem where right. literally the branding worked too well. Uh, the, the reputation was too good. And peop- I had so many people calling that right. I just, there literally wasn't enough time in the day to get right. back to every single person. And so I had to create systems to be able to do that, i.e. like putting a form on my website that would right. pre-qualify some of these people so I wouldn't get as many calls. Right. Uh, what, I, I do want to get back to your task management, though. Was well, there a specific one that you like and that you recommend? Um, I guess I mine that I use is within my CRM software, so I don't have a outside one that I use. I will say I love Todoist for just a general to do program. That one seems to work really well for a lot of my clients. In addition to that, Evernote actually recently added tasks in their into Evernote into their software, which was a very new addition and something. I didn't expect them to ever do. Well, I know they aren't you like a certified Evernote person. But don't I you am. Have a, I'm a certified Evernote expert. Okay, I know. Means, I know you're. Yeah, yeah, I know you're big in Evernote. Uh, what, for those that don't even know what Evernote is, why don't you real quick explain what that is? Evernote is a note taking app. Essentially, I liken it to an empty container. When you're organizing in a house, you can put just about anything into this empty container. Evernote's an empty container for your information. So it's a symbol of an elephant and the, the slogan is remember everything. So anything that you need to remember, you can write it down in Evernote, put it in there, snap a picture of stuff. You can clip things off of the internet. There's a hundred ways you can get stuff into Evernote. It would be comparable if you've heard of OneNote or Mm -hmm. Google Keep. It would be comparable to those, although, of course, I think it's superior. So, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, I've used all of those. I I like Keep's simplicity. It's like much more easier, but it does not organize as nowhere near as well as Evernote. Um, So, yeah, I've, I've used Evernote. It's a great way to keep things organized. Well, we talked about accounting. We talked about PM. We talked about task management. Is there anything like for, I mean, obviously CRM, like, you know, customer relations, if your PM software doesn't allow any type of CRM, then they would probably need to have something, right? Right. I think that's key. I mean, one of the things that I even look at with my clients is email management. How are you handling your emails that are coming in? Where are you storing the information that you need to hold on to? What information do you need to hold on to, first of all? And then sometimes that plays hand in hand with the CRM as well, where maybe the CRM automatically captures all those emails and connects it to your leads and your clients. So now, email is huge. No, you, there was one other, like, is there's a CRM that you're also pretty fond of? Which one is that? I love Insightly for just a general non industry specific software. Okay. I'm also actually working with Keep right now. It used to be known as Infusionsoft. Um, Keep is more focused on marketing and automation, where Insightly is more focused on task and project management. So gotcha. again, okay. each one is so different. They each have their strengths, their weaknesses. So I like to sit down with somebody and find out what are you looking for? What are you struggling with that we can solve with this software? and then help pick the correct one for them. Yeah, and, and one thing why this is so important, like your services and and really having like consulting with someone is especially today, like every day there's, you know, 500 new softwares that hit the market <laughs> and it, it's literally overwhelming. Right. I have to like, I get, I'll get stuck on soft, you know, uh, platforms like AppSumo yes. where they share new software and I'll like, 
like literally I'll like buy or trial three different softwares. And then I'm like, next thing I know, I have the 27 softwares and I'm trying to, and I'm like, okay, stop, yes. stop, stop. Yeah. AppSumo is the best and the worst for that. It's that's, it's my favorite, but then also I do the same thing. I'm like, Ooh, shiny object, Ooh, shiny object. Yeah. And instead of the business owner themselves getting wrapped up in all these shiny objects, if you get online and you're like, Hey, what CRM are you using or what software is best? You're going to get 500 different answers. And so that's where using a consultant to say, okay, let's back it up. Quit getting distracted by all the shiny objects, quit listening to 500 opinions. And let's actually look at my business. What am I doing in my business? What needs do I have? What problems do I need to solve? And then therefore what software is going to fix that? Yeah, and that's going to be different for every single person because right. you also have to consider take into consideration their technology literacy, right? Like, absolutely, I mean, yes. Not to pick on contractors, but we're not the smartest guys out there, and some of us can barely even turn our phone on. You know what I mean? And then here you are telling them to download the software to run their whole business, and that thought right there is overwhelming. Right? Like they would rather just have a you know one of those old calendar things that Menard sends you every year and you just write down everything in there. And it's like, right. that's great until you leave the office and leave it in your, sitting on your desk and you're right. an hour away from the office. Like yeah. that's the benefit of technology is that it's everywhere. Right. And I, I think there can be a curse. There's also a curse of that, right? Like we need to disconnect and not always be reachable. Right. I.e. My wife always tells me to turn my phone off um, because, you know, <laughs> And, and sometimes it is work-related. I am responding to an email or a text or whatever. But it's such a balance. And so I think it's super critical to have someone like you to be able to, to consult with. But also, because it can be overwhelming. As smart as I am about CRMs, like as much research as, I, research as I've done, and I've researched probably 20 to 30 different project management CRM type things, I've signed up for one and six months into it, after transferring all of the information yes. and setting everything up and spending, you know, 80 to 100 man hours, I've said, I hate this. Right. Like, this is not exactly. what I want. Yes. And then I had to switch again. Yeah. That happens more often than it should. And, and then what, 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 I, yeah. And what I see happening is they'll, they'll, you know, they'll listen to this podcast and they'll hear you say, oh, get Evernote and like, cool. Right. And they go in and they, and which Evernote's not that expensive, but right. it doesn't matter what it is. If it's fraudulent and they go and they buy this software that costs a lot of money right. and they try to use it for, you know, an hour one day and they get so frustrated and then they just quit using it. And then they like, if, especially if they, if it's a one-time purchase where they had to spend 500 bucks or whatever, like you're just out that money. Right. I think that that's one of the things that I bring to the table as well is helping people not necessarily add software or not necessarily switch software, but better utilize the stuff that you already are paying for. There are so many people out there that are paying for CRMs or they're paying for Evernote or they're paying for QuickBooks, but they're not using it or they're not using it right. <laughs> and yeah. so helping them maximize. Maybe like I, I had a client that worked for, I don't want to give the name, but one of the hospitals parent company and they worked for this company. They were in it and they were like, I hate outlook. It's horrible. And I'm like, outlook, that's like tried and true software, right? Yeah. It's been refined over millions of users and years and years and years. And I'm like, what do you mean you hate it? Well, what it boiled down to was when she pulled up her home screen, it was too cluttered and she felt like she couldn't focus on things. And mm. so by simply customizing the home screen, simplifying, color coding things, she then was like, oh my gosh, this software is amazing. <laughs> so it's not necessarily even the software itself that's the problem. It's how you're using it. Even smartphones, I mean, how many people are actually utilizing the power that we have in the palm of our hand? So one of the things I do with my clients too is I'll look at their computer and their telephone, their cell phone, and I'll say, let's look at your settings. Let's see what can we do to simplify, streamline, and maximize how you're using your 
technology so that you can be more productive and focused and proactive in your life and your work. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's like perfect. I think that's the perfect way to come to bring this to a close. I, I think the number one takeaway that I've got from this, and I, and I did a podcast on this earlier this year, and, and that is you really have to be intentional with what you're trying to accomplish, right? And so yes. if you're listening to this podcast and you're like all excited, oh, I, I really need to go get a, a, a CRM or, you know, PM software or whatever, and you go home and you search it in and you, you know, even if you look at the one that I recommended and you go and you buy it and you haven't done any research and you haven't, you know, done any of that and then you try to open it and it's like, oh, this is too, this is too hard and I don't really have any intention on trying to get better. Right. It's just going to be a waste of your time and energy. Right. A saying I love is a good software doesn't fix a bad process. I, I lo- I'm going to write that down. You have right to know what your process is and what you're trying to accomplish before you try to utilize the software. Because otherwise, good, you can have bells and whistles and it still doesn't accomplish anything for you. A good yeah. software does not solve a bad process. Is that what you said? Essentially, yes. I'm writing this down because I, I love that. A good software does not solve a bad process. Right. Or essentially. Essentially, something <laughs> like that. <Yes. laughs> so, Amy, how can people find out more about your services or get in touch with you? They can go to my website. It's lastingorder.net or they can Find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Google My Business, you name it. I do work with people all over the country via Zoom. And so it's not limited to my geographic region. Obviously, if you want your closet organized, you need to find a local professional organizer. (laughs) Which you could probably put them in touch with some networks that be able to do that. Absolutely. I would refer you to someone who's a member of the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals. If you need office space or, you know, your office space organized, physical physical spaces organized, you're going to want to find somebody local. If you're looking for habits, routines, digital technology stuff, give me a call. I'd be happy to help. You could also email me. It's amy, A-M-Y, at lastingorder.net. And we'll put all your links to your social media and all that stuff in the show notes. So you guys can go look in the show notes and get access to that. Amy, uh, one last question I like to ask everybody. And that is, what is, what's the current book you're reading or one that you uh, really like? Um, I would say my current favorite is Atomic Habits by yep. James Clear. That's a really good one. That's I a love really, that really book. Good one. It's fantastic. Because yep. really, like I said, all of maintaining organization boils down to your habits. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Amy, I thank you so much for being on the show today. I, I do want to ask you one last question. I lied to you. What, <laughs> if, if someone, what is this, the single biggest takeaway that you can give someone? Like if they're struggling with organization, like what would be your parting words to them to, to try and help them? Biggest single thing. Wow, so much pressure, Brad. (laughs) That's how we roll here, Amy. Pressure. Start somewhere. I mean, do something. I think that when people feel disorganized, they have this feeling of overwhelm. And that causes this um, analysis paralysis. And so by doing something, maybe even the, what is it, two-second lean? Two-second lean, yeah. By doing something, by taking one step forward, it causes you to start this trajectory of positive change. So do something, do something. Love it. Do something, do something. (laughs) Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Amy. This was a lot of fun. I really appreciate all your insight. And guys, uh, you know where to find me on all the social media platforms, Hammer and Grind Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Uh, Also, don't uh, forget about our Discord channel. That's uh, Hammer and Grind. You can search us there. And uh, like always, guys, until next time, you know what to do. Be the best version of you. 